Hi, I'm Alice Hafley. I'm a program supervisor here at Camp For All. Um, continuing our Harry Potter, I hope that you all watched our Quidditch video because that was the most fun. Um, we are almost done with this book. We have two more days and we're going to be able to do it. Today I have my Harry Potter and the, um, the oh my gosh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince docs on because that is the best book, obviously. Um, but we are reading Harry Potter. So we're going to do four chapters today. I have my tea, I have my water, and uh, yeah, we are ready to go. All right, chapter 11, Quidditch. As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. The mountains around the school became icy gray and the lake like chilled steel. Every morning, the ground was covered in frost. Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs window defrosting the broomsticks on the Quidditch field bundled up in a long moleskin overcoat, rabbit fur gloves, and enormous beaver skin boots. The Quidditch season had begun. On Saturday, Harry would be playing in his first match after weeks of training, Gryffindor versus Slytherin. If Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the house championship. Hardly anyone had seen Harry play because Wood had decided that as their secret weapon, Harry should be kept, well, secret. But the news that he was playing secret had leaked out somehow and Harry didn't know which was worse, people telling him he'd be brilliant or people telling him they'd be running around underneath them holding a mattress. It was really lucky that Harry now had Hermione as a friend. He didn't know how he had gotten through all his homework without her, what with all the last minute Quidditch practice Wood was making them do. She also lent him Quidditch through the ages, which turned out to be a very interesting Harry learned that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul and that all of them had happened during a World Cup match in 1473, that Seekers were usually the smallest and fastest players, and that most serious Quidditch accidents seemed to happen to them, that although people rarely died playing Quidditch, referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Hermione had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules since Harry and Ron had saved her from the mountain troll, troll and she was much nicer for it. The day before Harry's first Quidditch match, the three of them were out in the freezing courtyard during break and she had conjured them a bright blue fire that could be carried around in a jam jar. Standing with their backs to it, getting warm when Snape crossed the yard, Harry noticed at once that Snape was limping. Harry, Ron, and Hermione moved closer together to block the fire from view. They were sure it wouldn't be allowed. Unfortunately, something about their guilty faces caught Snape's eye. He limped over. He hadn't seen the fire, but he seemed to be looking for a reason to tell them off anyway. What have you got there, Potter? It was Quidditch through the ages, Harry showed him. Library books are not to be taken outside the school, said Snape. Give it to me, five points from Gryffindor. He just made that rule up, Harry muttered angrily as Snape limped away. Wonder what's wrong with his leg? Dunno, but I hope it's really hurting him, said Ron bitterly. The Gryffindor common room was very noisy that evening. Harry, Ron, and Hermione sat together next to a window. Hermione was checking Harry and Ron's charms homework for them. She would never let them copy. How will you learn? But by asking her to read it through, they got the right answers anyway. Harry felt restless. He wanted Quidditch through the ages back, his mind off his nerves about tomorrow. Why should he be afraid of Snape? Getting up, he told Ron and Hermione he was going to ask Snape if he could have it. Better you than me, they said together, but Harry had an idea that Snape wouldn't refuse if there were other teachers listening. He made his way down to the staff room and knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again. Nothing. Professor Snape had left the book in there. Um, it, was worth a, uh, it was worth a try. He pushed the door ajar and peered inside, and a horrible scene met his eyes. Snape and Filch were inside alone. Snape was holding above his knee. One of his legs was bloody and mangled. Filch was handing Snape bandages. Blasted thing, Snape was saying. How are you supposed to keep your eyes on all three heads at once? Harry tried to shut the door quietly, but... Potter! Snape's face was twisted with fear. He rose quickly to hide his leg. Harry gulped. I just wondered if I could have my book back. Get out! Out! Harry left before Snape could take any more points from Gryffindor. He sprinted back upstairs. Did you get it? Ron asked as Harry joined them. What's the matter? In a low whisper, Harry told them what he'd seen. You know what this means? breathlessly. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. That's where he was going when we saw him. After He's after what it's guarding, and I bet my broomstick he let that troll in to make a diversion. Hermione's eyes were wide. No, he wouldn't, she 
It's not very nice, but he wouldn't try and steal something Dumbledore was keeping safe. Honestly, Hermione, you think all teachers are saints or something, snapped. I'm with Harry. I wouldn't put anything past Snape. But what's he after? What's that dog guarding? Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with the same question. Neville was snoring loudly, but Harry couldn't sleep. He tried to empty his mind. He needed to sleep. He had to. He had his first Quidditch match in a few hours. But the expression on Snape's face when Harry had seen his leg wasn't easy to forget. The next morning dawned very bright and cold. The great hall was full of the delicious smell of fried sausages and the cheerful chatter of everyone looking forward to a good Quidditch match. You've got to eat some breakfast. I don't want anything. Just a bit of toast, wheedled Hermione. I'm not hungry. Harry In an hour's time, he'd be walking onto the field. Harry, you need your strength, said Seamus Finnegan. Seekers are always the ones who get clobbered by the other team. Thanks, Seamus, said Harry, watching Seamus pile ketchup on his sausages. By 11 o'clock, the whole school seemed to be out in the stands around the Quidditch pitch. Many students had binoculars. Seats might be raised high in the air, but it was still difficult to see what was going on sometimes. Ron and Hermione joined Neville, Seamus, and Dean, the West Ham fan, up in the top row. As a surprise for Harry, they had painted a large banner on one of the sheets Scabbers had ruined. It said Potter for President, and Dean, who was good at drawing, had done a large Gryffindor lion underneath. Hermione had performed a tricky little charm so that the paint flashed different colors. Meanwhile, in the locker room, Harry and the rest of the team were changing into their scarlet Quidditch robes. Slytherin would be playing in green. Wood cleared his throat for silence. Okay, men, he said. And women, said Chaser Angelina Johnson. And women, Wood agreed. This is it. The big one, said Fred Weasley. The one we've all been waiting for, said George. You know Oliver's speech by heart, Fred told Harry. We were on the team last year. Shut up, you two, said Wood. This is the best Gryffindor this is the best team Gryffindor's had in years. We're going to win, I know it. He glared at all at them all to say or else. Right, it's time. Good luck, all of you. Harry followed Fred and George out of the locker room and, hoping his knees weren't going to give way, walked onto the field to loud cheers. Madam Hooch was refereeing. She stood in the middle of the field, waiting for the two teams, her broom in her hand. Now I want a nice fair game, all of you, she said. Once they were all gathered around her, Harry noticed that she seemed to be speaking particularly to the Slytherin captain, Marcus Flint, a sixth year. Harry thought Flint looked as if he had some troll blood in him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the fluttering banner high above, flashing Potter for president over the crowd. His heart skipped. He felt braver. Mount your brooms, please. Harry clambered onto his Nimbus 2000. Madame Hooch gave a loud blast on her silver whistle. Fifteen brooms rose up, high, high into the air. They were off. And the quaffle is taken immediately by Angelina Johnson of Gryffindor. What an excellent chaser that girl is, and rather attractive, too. Jordan! Sorry, Professor. The, Weasley's twin, the Weasley twins' friend, Lee Jordan, was doing the commentary for the match, closely watched by Professor McGonagall. And she's really belting along up there. A neat pass to Alicia Spinnett, a good find of Oliver Woods, last year only a reserve. Back to Johnson, and nope, the Slytherins have taken the quaffle. Slytherin captain Marcus Flint gains the quaffle, and off he goes. Flint flying like an eagle up there. He's going to, nope, stopped by an excellent move by Gryffindor keeper Wood. And the Gryffindors take the quaffle. That's Chaser Katie Bell of Gryffindor there. Nice dive around the Flint. Around Flint, off up the field, and ouch, that must have hurt, hit in the back of the head by a bludger. Quaffle taken by the Slytherins. That's Adrian Pusey speeding off toward the goalposts, but he's blocked by a second bludger, sent his way by Fred or George Weasley, can't tell which. Nice play by the Gryffindor beater. And in possession of the Quaffle, a clear field ahead, and off she goes, she's really flying. Dodges a speeding bludger, the goalposts are ahead. Come on now, Angelina, keeper Bletchley dives, misses Gryffindor, score! Gryffindor cheers filled the cold air with howls and moans from the Slytherins. Budge up there, move along. Hagrid! Ron and Hermione squeeze together to give Hagrid enough space to join them. Then watching from me hut, said Hagrid, painting a large pair of binoculars, patting a large pair of binoculars around. But it isn't the same as being in the crowd. No sign of the snitch yet, eh? Nope, said Ron. Harry hasn't had much to do yet. Keep kept out of trouble, though, that's something, said Hagrid, raising his binoculars and peering skyward at the speck that was Harry. Way above them, Harry was gliding over the game, squinting about for some sign of the snitch. This was part of his and Wood's game plan. Keep out of the way until you catch sight of the snitch, Wood had said. We don't want to see you attacked before you have to be. When Angelina had scored, Harry had done a couple of loop-the-loops to let off his feelings. Now he was back to staring about, around for the snitch. Once he caught sight of a flash of gold, but it was just a reflection from one of the Weasley's wristwatches, and once a bludger decided to come pelting his way, more like a cannonball than anything, but Harry dodged it, and Fred Weasley came chasing after it. All right there, Harry, he had time to yell as he beat the bludger furiously toward Marcus Flint. Slytherin in possession, Lee Jordan was saying, Chaser, Pusey, Ducks, two bludgers, two Weasleys, and Chaser Bell, and speeds toward the- Wait a minute, was that the snitch? 
A murmur ran through the crowd as Adrian Pusey dropped the quaffle, too busy looking over his shoulder at the flash of gold that had passed his left ear. Harry saw it. In a great rush of excitement, he dived downward after the streak of gold. Slytherin seeker Terence Higgs had seen it too. Neck and neck, they hurtled toward the snitch. All the chasers seemed to have forgotten what they were supposed to be doing as they hung in midair to watch. Harry was faster than Higgs. He could see the little round ball, wings fluttering, darting up ahead. He put on an extra spurt of speed. Wham! A roar of rage echoed from the Gryffindors below. Marcus Flint had blocked Harry on purpose, and Harry's broom spun off course, Harry holding on for dear life. Foul! screamed the Gryffindors. Madame Hooch spoke angrily to Flint and then ordered a free shot at the goalposts for Gryffindor. But in all the confusion, of course, the golden snitch had disappeared from sight again. Down in the stands, Dean Thomas was yelling, Send him off, Rev! Red card! What are you talking about, Dean, said Ron. Red card, said Dean furiously. In soccer, you get shown the red card and you're out of the game. This isn't soccer, Dean, Ron reminded him. Hagrid, however, was on Dean's side. They ought to change the rules. Flint, Pierre. Lee Jordan was finding it difficult not to take sides. So after that obvious and disgusting bit of cheating, Jordan, growled Professor McGonagall. I mean, after that open and revolting foul, Jordan, I'm warning you. All right, all right. Flint nearly kills the Gryffindor seeker, which could happen to anyone, I'm sure. So a penalty to Gryffindor taken by Spinnet, who puts it away, no trouble, and we continue to play. Gryffindor still in possession. It was as Harry dodged another bludger, which went spinning dangerously past happened. His broom gave a sudden frightening lurch. For a split second, he thought he was going to fall. He gripped the broom tightly with both hands and knees. He didn't felt anything like that. It happened again. It was, a, it was as though the broom was trying to buck him off, but Nimbus 2000s did not suddenly decide to buck their riders off. Harry tried to turn back toward the front door goalposts. He had half a mind to ask Wood to call time out, and then he realized that his broom was completely out of his control. He couldn't turn it. He couldn't direct it at all. It was zigzagging through the air, and every now and violent swishing movements that almost unseated him. Lee was still commentating. Slytherin in possession, Flint with the quaffle, passes Spinet, passes Bell, hit hard in the face by a bludger, hope it broke his nose. Only joking, Professor. Slytherin score. Oh no. The Slytherins were cheering. No one seemed to have noticed that Harry's broom was behaving strangely. It was carrying him from the game, jerking and twitching as it went. To know what Harry thinks he's doing, Hagrid mumbled. He stared through his binoculars. If I didn't know better, I'd say he'd lost control of his broom, but he can't have. Suddenly, people were pointing up at Harry all over the stands. His broom had started to roll over and over, with him only managing to hold on. Then the whole crowd gasped. Harry's broom had given a wild jerk, and Harry swung off it. He was now dangling from it, holding on with only one hand. Did something happen to it when... Seamus whispered. Can't have, Hagrid said, his voice shaking. Can't nothing interfere with a broomstick except powerful dark magic. No kid could do that to a Nimbus 2000. At these words, Hermione seized Hagrid's binoculars. But instead of looking up at Harry, she started looking frantically at the crowd. What are you doing, moaned Ron, gray face. I knew it, Hermione gasped. Look! Ron grabbed the binoculars. Snape was in the middle of the stands opposite him. He had his eyes fixed on Harry and was muttering nonstop under his breath. He's doing something, jinxing the broom, said Hermione. What should we do? Leave it to me. Before Ron could say another word, Hermione had disappeared. Ron turned the binoculars back on Harry. His broom was vibrating so hard it was almost impossible for him to hang on much longer. The crowd was on its feet, watching terrified as the Weasleys flew up to try and pull Harry safely onto one of the brooms, but it was no good. Every time they got near him, the broom would jump higher still. They dropped lower and circled beneath him, obviously hoping to catch him if he fell. Marcus Flint seized the quaffle and scored five times without anyone noticing. Come on, Hermione, Ron muttered desperately. Hermione had fought her way across to stand where Snape stood and was now racing along the row behind him. She didn't even stop to say sorry her quarrel head first into the row in front. Reaching Snape, she crouched down, pulling out her wand, and whispered a few well-chosen words. Bright blue flames shot from her wand onto the hem of Snape's robes. It took perhaps 30 seconds for Snape to realize that he was on fire. A sudden help told her she had done her job. Scooping the fire off him into a little jar in her pocket, she scrambled back along the row. Snape would never know what had happened. It was enough. Up in the air, Harry was suddenly able to clamber back onto his broom. Neville, you can look, Ron said. Neville had been sobbing into Hagrid's jacket for the last five minutes. Harry was speeding toward the ground when the crowd saw him clap his hand to his mouth as though he were going to be sick. He hit the field on all fours, coughed, and something gold fell into his hand. I've got the snitch, he shouted. And the game ended in complete confusion. He didn't catch it. He nearly swallowed it. 
Flint was still howling 20 minutes later, but it made no difference. Harry hadn't broken any rules, and Lee Jordan was still happily shouting the results. Gryffindor had won by 170 to 60. Harry heard none of this, though. He was being made a cup of strong tea back in Hagrid's hut with Ron and Hermione. It was Snape, Ron was explaining. Her Hermione and I saw him. He was cursing your broomstick, muttering. He wouldn't take his eyes off of you. Rubbish, said Hagrid, who hadn't heard a word of what had gone on next to him in the stands. Why would Snape do something like that? Harry, Ron, and Hermione looked at one another, wondering what to do. Harry decided on the truth. I found out something about him, he told Hagrid. He tried to get past that three-headed dog on Halloween. It bit him. We think he was trying to steal whatever it's guarding. Hagrid dropped the teapot. How do you know about Fluffy, he said. Fluffy? Yeah, he's mine. Bought him off a Greek chappy I met in the pub last year. I lent him to Dumbledore to guard the... Yes, said Harry eagerly. Now don't ask me any more. Roughly, that's top secret, that is. But Snape's trying to steal said Hagrid again. Snape's a Hogwarts teacher. He'd do nothing of the sort. So why did he just try and kill Harry? cried Hermione. The afternoon's events certainly seemed to have changed her mind about Snape. I know a jinx when I see one, Hagrid. I've read all about them. You've got to keep eye contact, and Snape wasn't blinking at all. I saw him. I'm telling you, you're wrong, said Hagrid. I don't know why Harry's broom acted like that, but Snape wouldn't try and kill a student. Now listen to me, all three of you. You're meddling in things that don't concern you. It's dangerous. You forget dog, and you know, forget what it's garden. That's between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Aha, said Harry, so there's some Nicholas Flamel involved, is there? Hagrid looked furious with himself. Chapter 12. The Mirror of Erised. Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. The lake froze solid, and the Weasley twin the lake froze solid, and the Weasley twins were punished for bee witching several snowballs. So they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. The few owls that managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver mail had to be nursed back to help by Hagrid before they could fly off again. No one could wait for the holidays to start. While the Gryffindor common room and the Great Hall had roaring fires, the drafty corridors had become icy and a bitter wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them and they kept as close as possible to their hot cauldrons. I do feel so sorry, said Draco Malfoy when potions class. Those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crabbe and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring out powdered spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malfoy had been more unpleasant than usual since the Quidditch match. Disgusted that the Slytherins had lost, he had tried to get everyone laughing at how a wide-mouthed tree frog would be replacing Harry as seeker next. Then he'd realized that nobody found this funny because they were all so impressed at the way Harry had managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. So Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to Privet Drive for Christmas, but around the week before making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays and Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Ron and his brothers were staying too because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the dungeons at the end of potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead. Two enormous feet sticking out at the bottom at, and a loud puffing sound told him that Hagrid was behind it. Hi, Hagrid. Want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Nah, I'm all right. Thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? Came Malfoy's cold drawl from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money, Weasley? Hoping to be a gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts? I suppose that hut of Hagrid's must seem like a palace compared to what your family's used to. Ron dived at Malfoy just as Snape came up the stairs. Weasley! Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape, said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face out from behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting his family. Be that as it may, fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, said Snape silkily. Five points from Gryffindor, Weasley, and be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle pushed roughly past the tree, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinding his teeth at Malfoy's back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, said Harry, Malfoy, and Snape. Come on, cheer up. It's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Come with me and see the great treat. So the three of them followed Hagrid and his tree off to the where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Ah, Hagrid, the last tree. Put it in the far corner, would you? 
The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls, and no less than 12 towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays? Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione, and that reminds me. Harry, Ron, we've got half an hour before lunch. We should be in the library. Oh yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand and was trailing them over the branches of the new tree. The library, said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays, bit keen, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Harry told him brightly. Ever since you mentioned Nicholas Flamel, we've been trying to find out who he is. You what? Shocked. Listen here, I've told you, drop it. It's nothing to you but the dog's garden. We just want to know who Nicholas Flamel is, that's all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to tell us and save us the trouble, Harry added. We must have been through hundreds of books already and we can't find him anywhere. Just give us a hint. I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out for ourselves then, said Ron, and they left Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off to the they had indeed been searching books for Flamel's name ever since Hagrid had let it slip, because how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in Great Wizards of the 20th Century or a notable magical name. He was missing, too, from important modern magical discoveries and a study of recent developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library, tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had decided to search, while Ron strode off toward down a row of books and started pulling them off the shelves at random. Harry wandered over to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Flamel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you need a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books, and he knew he'd never get one. These were the books containing powerful dark magic, never taught at Hogwarts, and only read by older students studying advanced defense against the dark arts. What are you looking for? Nothing, said Harry. Madame Pince, the librarian, brandished a feather duster at him. You'd better get out then. Go on, out. Wishing he a bit quicker at thinking up the same some story, Harry left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed they'd better not ask Madame Pince where they could find Flamel. They were sure she'd be able to tell them, but they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. Harry waited out in the corridor to see if the other two had found anything, but he wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for two weeks, after all, but as they only had odd moments between lessons, it wasn't surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madame Pince breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I'm away, won't you? said Hermione. And send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, said Ron. It'd be safe to ask them. Very safe, as they're both dentists, said Hermione. Once the holidays had started, Ron and Hermione were having, er, Harry were having too good a time to think much about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves, and the common room was far emptier than usual, so they were able to get the good arm fire. They sat by the hour eating anything they could spear on a toasting fork, bread, English muffins, marshmallows, and plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which were fun to talk about but didn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard's chess. This was exactly like muggle chess, except that the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in battle. Ron's set was very old and battered. Like everything else he owned, it had once belonged to someone else in his family, in this case, his grandfather. However, old chessmen weren't a drawback at all. Ron knew them so well, he'd never had, he never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with chessmen Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player yet, and they kept shouting different bits of advice at him, which was confusing. Don't send me there! Can't you see his knight? Send me him! We can afford to lose him! On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed looking forward to the next day for food and fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he woke early the next morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of the Merry Christmas, said Ron sleepily, as Harry scrambled out of bed and pulled on his bathrobe. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What do you expect? Turnips, said Ron, turning to his pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped in thick brown paper, and scrawled across it was to Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second, very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclose your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Taped to the note was a 50 pence piece. That's friendly, said Harry. 
Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Weird, he said. What a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hagrid and uncle. So who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, turning a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy parcel. My mom. I told her you didn't expect any presents and, oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley sweater. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick hand knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a sweater, said Ron, unwrapping his own, and mine's always maroon. That's really nice of her, said Harry, trying the fudge, which was very tasty. His next present also contained candy, a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. This only left one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery gray went slithering to the floor where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavored beans he'd gotten from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. Lady cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders and Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they were gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him, just his head suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter. Written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very merry you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open and Fred and George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else yet. Merry Christmas! Hey, look! Harry's got a Weasley sweater, too! Fred and George were wearing blue sweaters, one with a large yellow with a G. Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's sweater. She's obviously made more of an effort if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George, come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron moaned half-heartedly and he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name, but we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge. Noise. Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapproving. He had clearly gotten halfway through unwrapping his presents as he, too, carried a lumpy sweater over his arm, which Fred seized. P for Prefect! Get it on, Percy! Come on, we're all wearing ours! Even Harry got one! I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced the sweater over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the Prefects today, either, said George. Christmas is a time for family. They frog-marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his side by his sweater. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chipolatas, tureens of buttered peas, thick rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard's crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic party favors were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats inside. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred and it didn't just bang. It went off with a blast like a cannon and it fell in a cloud of blue smoke while from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up at the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed, her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow-your-own warts kit, and his new own wizard's chess set. The, wizard, the white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight on the grounds. Then, cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in Gryffindor Common Room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a meal of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle, and Christmas, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed.
sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it, the invisibility cloak and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake and nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his four-poster. Harry leaned over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father's. This had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back. His father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, around the common room, and climbed through the portrait hole. Who's there? squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Oh, he stopped his heart racing and thought, and then it came to him, the restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. He set off, drawing the invisible tight around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the row of books. The lamp looked as if it were floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope that separated these books, of the library, he lep held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. Their peeling, faded gold letters spelled words in languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck tickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not, but he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere. Setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting-looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty, because it was very heavy, and, balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped it shut. The shriek went on and on, one high, unbroken, ear-splitting noise. He stumbled backward and knocked over his lamp, which went out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Stuffing the shrieking book back onto the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch in the doorway, Filch's pale, wild eyes looking straight through him, and Harry under Filch's outstretched arm and streaked off up the corridor, the book's shriek still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going, perhaps because it wasn't he didn't recognize where he was at all. There was a suit of armor near the kitchens, he knew, but he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody's been in the library, restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting and to his horror, it was Snape who replied, The restricted section? Well, they can't be far. We'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corridor ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor, and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him and stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ajar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move it, and to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past, and Harry leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. It had, that had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like an unused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and piled against the walls, and there was an upturned waste paper basket. But propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there, something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror as high as the ceiling, a neat gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved across the top, Erised stra eru oit ube kafru oit on wohishi. His panic faded now that there was no sound of Filch and Snape. Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wait, wanting to look at himself, but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He whirled around. His heart was pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed, for he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people right behind him. 
But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking, and there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still no one was there. Or were they all invisible too? Would they act in a room full of invisible people, and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so together, but he felt only air. She was a pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape, but then he noticed that she was crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. The tall, thin, and black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back just as Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mom, he whispered, Dad? They just looked at him, smiling, and slowly Harry looked into the faces of the other people in the mirror and saw other people green eyes like his, other noses like his, even a little old man who looked as though he had Harry's knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potter smiled and waved at Harry, and he stared hungrily back at them, his hands pressed flat against the glass, as though he had was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know did not fade and he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses he couldn't stay here he had to find his way back to bed he tore his eyes away from his mother's face whispered i'll come back and hurried from the room you could have woken me up said ron crossly you can come tonight i'm going back i want to show you the mirror I'd like to see your mom and dad, Ron said eagerly, and I want to see all your family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to show me your other brothers and everyone. You can see them any old times, said Ron. Just come round my house this summer. Anyway, maybe it only shows dead people. Shame about not finding Flamel, though. Have some bacon or something. Why aren't you eating anything? Harry couldn't eat. He had seen his parents and would be seeing them again tonight. He had almost forgotten about Flamel. It didn't seem very important anymore. Who cared what the three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape stole it, really? Are you all right, said Ron? You look odd. What Harry said most was that he might not be able to find the mirrored room again. With Ron covered in the cloak, too, they had to walk much more slowly the next night. They tried retracing Harry's route from the library, wandering around the dark passageways for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's forget it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed the ghost of a tall witch gliding in the opposite direction, but saw no one else. Just as Ron started moaning that his feet were dead with cold, Harry spotted the suit of armor. It's here, just here, yes! They pushed the door open. Harry dropped the cloak from around his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were, his mother and father beaming at the sight of him. See, Harry whispered, I can't see anything. Look, look at them all. There are loads of them. I can only see you. Look at it properly. Go on, stand where I am. Harry stepped aside, but with Ron in front of the mirror, he couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in his paisley pajamas. Ron thought, was, though, was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me, he said. Can you see all your family standing around you? No, I look different. I look older and I'm head boy. What? I am, I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to and I'm holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup. I'm Quidditch captain too. Ron tore his eyes away from the splendid sight to look excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows How can it? All my family are dead. Let me have another look. You had it all to yourself last night. Give me a bit more time. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. Don't push me. A sudden noise outside the corridor put an end to their discussion. They hadn't realized how loudly they'd been talking. Quick! Ron threw the cloak back over them as the luminous eyes of Mrs. Norris came to the door. Ron and Harry stood still, both thinking the same thing. Did the cloak work on cats? After what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might have gone for Filch. I bet she heard us. Come on. And Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still hadn't melted the next morning. Want to play chess, Harry? Said Ron. No. Why don't we go down and visit Hagrid? No, you go. I know what you're thinking about, Harry. That mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I've just got a bad feeling about it. And anyway, you've had too many clothes shaves already. Filch, Snape, and Mrs. Norris are wandering around see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Hermione. I'm serious, Harry. Don't go. But Harry only had one thought in his head, which was to get back in front of the mirror, and Ron wasn't going to stop him.
that the third night he found his way more quickly than before. He was walking fast, he knew he was making more noise than wise, but he didn't meet anyone. And there were his mother and father smiling at him again, and one of his grandfathers nodding happily. Harry sank down to sit on the floor in front of the mirror. There was nothing to stop him from saying, staying here all night with his family. Nothing at all, except... So, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his insides had turned to ice. He looked sitting on one of the desks by the wall was none other than Albus Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him, so desperate to get to the mirror he hadn't noticed him. I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you, said Dumbledore, and Harry was relieved to see that he was smiling. So, said Dumbledore, slipping off the desk to sit on the floor with Harry, you, like hundreds before you, have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised. I didn't know it was called that, sir, but I expect you've realized what it does. It, well, it shows me my family, and it showed your friend Ron himself as head boy. How did you know... I don't need a cloak to become invisible, said Dumbledore gently. Now, can you think of what the mirror of Erised shows us all? Harry shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Erised like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Dumbledore quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. You, who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, sees himself standing alone, the best of them all. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is possible. The mirror will be moved to a new home, Harry, and no looking for it again. If you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Remember that. Now, why don't you pull that admirable cloak back on and get off to bed? Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously, you've just done so, Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see in the mirror? I? I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Harry stared. One can never have enough socks, said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. It was only when he was back in bed that it struck Harry that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. But then he thought, as he shoved Scabbers off his pillow, personal question. All right, two more chapters. Here we go. Oh, they're two good ones, too. Okay. Chapter 13, The Flamel. Dumbledore had convinced Harry not to go looking for the mirror of Erised again, and for the rest of the Christmas holidays, the invisibility cloak stayed folded at the bottom of his trunk. Harry wished he could forget what he'd seen in the mirror as easily, but he couldn't. He started having nightmares. Over and over again, he dreamed about his parents disappearing in a flash of green light while a high voice cackled with laughter. You see, Dumbledore was right. That mirror could drive you mad, said Ron, when Harry told him about these dreams. Hermione, who came back the day before term started, took a different view of things. She was torn between her at the idea of Harry being out of bed roaming the school three nights in a row, if Filch had caught you, and disappointment that he hadn't at least found out who Nicholas Flamel was. They had almost given up hope of ever finding Flamel in the story book, even though Harry was still name somewhere. Once term had started, they went back to skimming through books for ten minutes during their breaks. Harry had even less time than the other two because Quidditch practice had started again. What was working the team harder than ever, even the endless rain that had replaced the staff and his spirits? The Weasleys complained that Wood was being a fanatic, but Harry was on Wood's side. If they won their next match against Hufflepuff, they would overtake Slytherin in the house championship for the first time in seven years. Quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found out that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired out training. Then particularly wet and muddy practice session, Wood gave the team a bit of bad news. He had just gotten very angry with the Weasleys, who kept dive-bombing each other and fall off their brooms. Will you stop messing around, he yelled. That's exactly the sort of thing that'll lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time, and he'll be looking for any excuse to knock points off Gryffindor. George Weasley really did fall off his broom at these words. Snape's refereeing? He sputtered through a mouthful of mud. When's he ever refereed a Quidditch match? He's not going to be fair if we might overtake Slytherin. The rest of the team landed next to George to complain, too. It's not my fault, said Wood. We've just got to make sure we play a clean game so Snape hasn't got an excuse to pick on us. 
which was all very well, thought Harry, but he had another reason for not wanting Snape near him while he played Quidditch. The rest of the team hung back to talk to one another as usual at the end of practice, but Harry strutted, headed straight back to the Gryffindor common room where he found Ron and Hermione playing. Chess was the only thing Hermione ever lost at, something Harry and Ron thought was very good for her. Don't talk to me for a moment, said Ron when Harry sat down next to him. I need to constant. He caught sight of Harry's face. What's the matter with you? You look terrible. Speaking quietly so that no one else would hear, Harry told the other two about Snape's sudden sinister desire to be a Quidditch referee. Don't play, said Hermione at once. Say you're ill. Pretend to break your leg, Hermione suggested. Really break your leg, said Ron. I can't, said Harry. There isn't a reserve seeker. If I back out, Gryffindor can't play at all. At that moment, Neville toppled into the common room. How he had managed to climb through the portrait hole was anyone's guess because his legs had been stuck together with what they recognized at once as a leg locker curse. He must have had to bunny hop all the way up to Gryffindor Tower. Everyone fell over laughing except Hermione, who leapt up and the counter curse. Neville's legs sprang apart and he got to his feet. What happened? Hermione asked him, leading him over to sit with Harry and Ron. Malfoy, said Neville shakily. I met him outside the library. He said he'd been looking for someone to practice that on. Go to Professor McGonagall, Hermione urged Neville. Head. I don't want any more. Stand up to him, Neville, said Ron. He's used to walking all over people, but that's no reason to lie down in front of him and make it easier. There's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that, Neville choked out. Harry felt in the pocket of his robes and brought out a chocolate frog, the very last one from the box Hermione had given him for Christmas. He gave it to Neville, who looked as though he might cry. You're worth 12 of Malfoy, Harry said. The sorting hat chose you for Gryffindor, didn't it? And where's Malfoy in stinking Slytherin? Neville's lips twitched in a weak smile, and he unwrapped the frog. Thanks, Harry. I think I'll go to bed. Do you want the card? You collect them, don't you? As Neville said, Harry looked at the famous wizard card. Dumbledore again, he said. He was the first one I ever... He gasped. He stared at the back of the card. Then he looked up at Ron and Hermione. I found him, he whispered. I found Flamel. I told you I'd read the name somewhere before. I read it on the train coming here. Listen to this. Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945 for the discovery of the 12 uses of dragon's blood and his work on alchemy with his partner, Nicholas Flamel. He jumped to her feet. She hadn't looked so excited since they'd gotten back their marks from their very first piece of homework. Stay there, she said, and she sprinted up the stairs to the girls' dormitories. Harry and Ron barely had time to exchange mystified looks before she was dashing back, an enormous old book in her arms. I never thought to look in here, she whispered excitedly. I got this out of the library weeks ago for a bit of light reading. Light, said Ron, but Hermione told him to be quiet until she looked something up and started flicking frantically through the pages, muttering to herself. At last, she found what she was looking for. I knew it! I knew it! Are we allowed to speak yet? said Ron grumpily. Hermione ignored him. Nicholas Flamel, she whispered dramatically, the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. This didn't have quite the effect she expected. The what? said Harry and Ron. Oh, honestly, don't you two read? Look, read that there. She pushed the book toward them, and Harry and Ron read. The ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the Sorcerer's Stone, a legendary substance with astonishing powers. The stone will transform any metal into pure gold. It also produces the elixir of life, which will make the drinker immortal. There have been many Sorcerer's Stone over the centuries, but the only stone currently in existence belongs to Mr. Nicholas noted alchemist and opera lover. Mr. Flamel, who celebrated his 665th birthday last year, enjoys a nice quiet life in Devon with his wife, Purnell, 658. See, said Hermione when Harry and Ron finished, the dog must be guarding Flamel's sorcerer's stone. I bet he asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him because they're friends and he knew someone was after it. And that's why he wanted the stone moved out of Gringotts. A stone that makes gold and stops you from ever dying, said Harry. No wonder Snape's after it. Anyone would want it. And no wonder we couldn't find Flamel in that study of recent developments in wizardry, said Ron. He's not exactly recent if he's 665, is he? The next morning, in defense of while copying down different ways of wolf bites, Harry and Ron were still discussing what they'd do with a sorcerer's stone if they had one. It wasn't until Ron said he'd buy his own Quidditch team that Harry remembered about Snape and the coming match. I'm going to play, he told Ron. If all the Slytherins will think is that I'm just too scared to face Snape. I'll show them. It re it'll really wipe the smiles off of their faces if we win. Just as long as we're not wiping you off the field, said Hermione. As the match drew nearer, however, 
Harry became more and more nervous, whatever he told Ron and Hermione. The rest of the team wasn't too calm either. The idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it for seven years, but would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snape wherever he went. At times, he even wondered whether Snape was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potions lessons were turning into a sort of weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. Could Snape possibly know they'd found out about the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry didn't see how he could, yet he sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. And they wished him good luck outside the locker rooms the next time that Ron and Hermione were wondering whether they'd ever see him again alive. This wasn't what you'd call comforting. Harry hard, hardly heard a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled on his Quidditch robes and picked up his Nimbus 2000. Ron and Hermione Meanwhile, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practicing the leg locker curse. They had gotten the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville, and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any sign of wanting to hurt Harry. Now don't forget, it's locomotor mortis, Hermione muttered as Ron slipped his wand up his sleeve. I know, Ron snapped, don't nag. Back in the locker room, Wood had taken Harry aside. Don't want to pressure you, Potter, but if we ever need an early capture of the snitch, it's now. Finish the game before Snape can favor Hufflepuff too much. The whole school Fred Weasley peering out of the door. Even blimey Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's no mistaking that silver beard. Harry could have laughed out loud with relief. He was safe. There's simply no way that Snape would dare try to hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry at the team onto the field, something that Ron noticed too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look, they're off. Ouch. Someone had poked Ron in the back of the head. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly at Crabbe and Goyle. Wonder how long Potter's going to stay on his broom this time. Anyone want a bet? What are you? Ron didn't answer. Snape had just awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George Weasley had hit a bludger at him. Hermione had all her fingers crossed in her lap. Um, was squinting fixedly at Harry, who was circling the game like a hawk looking for the snitch. You know how I think they chose they choose people for the Gryffindor team, said Malfoy loudly a few minutes later, as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Neville went bright red, but turned in his seat to face Malfoy. I'm worth 12 of you, Malfoy, he stammered. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle howled with laughter, but Ron, still not daring to take his eyes from the game, said, you tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, you'd be poorer than Weasley, and that's saying something. Um, Ron's nerves were already stretched to the breaking point with anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy, one more word. Ron, said Hermione suddenly. Harry, what, where? Harry had suddenly gone down in a spectacular dive, which drew gasps and cheers from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her crossed fingers in her mouth, and Harry shook the ground like a bullet. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter's obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Ron snapped. Before Malfoy knew what was happening, Ron was on top of him, wrestling. Neville hesitated, then clambered over the back of his seat to help. Come on, Harry, Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at Snape. She didn't even notice Malfoy and Ron rolling around under her seat or the scuffles and yelps coming from the whirl of fists that was Neville, Crabbe, and Goyle. Up in the air, Snape turned on his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. The next second, Harry had pulled out of the dive, his arms raised in triumph, the snitch clasped in his hand. The stands erupted. It had to be a no one could ever remember the snitch being caught so quickly. Ron, Ron, where are you? The game is over. Harry's won. We've won. Gryffindor is in the lead, shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hugging Parvati Patil in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He'd done it. The game was over. It had barely lasted five minutes. As Gryffindors came spilling onto the field, he saw Snape land nearby, white-faced and tight-lipped. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder, looking up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly, so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you haven't been brooding about that mirror, been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly on the ground. Harry left the locker room alone some time later to take his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. He, could, he couldn't even remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of now. 
No one could say he was just a famous name anymore. The evening air had never smelled so sweet. He walked over to the damp grass, reliving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running to lift him onto their shoulders, Ron and Hermione in the distance, jumping up and down, Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. Harry had reached the shed. He leaned against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts, with its windows glowing red in the setting sun. Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He'd shown Snape. And speaking of Snape, a hooded figure came swiftly down the front steps of the castle, clearly, clearly not wanting to be seen. It walked as fast as possible toward the Forbidden Forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he watched. He recognized the figure's prowling walk. Snape sneaking into the forest while everyone else was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back on his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Gliding silently over the castle, he saw Snape enter the forest at a run. He followed. The tree thick he couldn't see where Snape had gone. He flew in circles lower and lower, brushing the top branches of the trees until he heard voices. He glided toward them and landed noiselessly in a towering beech tree. He climbed carefully along one of the branches, holding tight to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below, in a shadowy clearing, stood Snape, but he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there, too. Harry couldn't make out the look on his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what they were saying. Don't know why you wanted to meet here of all p places, Severus. Oh, I thought we'd keep this private, said Snape, his voice icy. Students aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone at all. Harry leaned forward. Quirrell was mumbling something. Snape interrupted him. Have you found out how to get past that beast of Hagrid's yet? But, 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 Severus, I... You don't want me as your enemy, Quirrell, said Snape, taking a step toward him. I, I don't know what you... You know perfectly well what I mean. An owl hooted loudly, and Harry near the tree. He studied himself in time to hear Snape say, You're a little bit of hocus-pocus. I'm waiting. But, but, I, I d don't... Very well, Snape cut in. We'll have another little chat soon, when you've had time to think things over and decide where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head and out the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Quirrell standing quite still as though he were petrified. Harry, where have you been? Hermione squeaked. We won! You won! We won! shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Malfoy a black eye, and Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle single-handed. He's still out cold, but Madame Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room. We're having a party. Fred and George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchens. Never mind that now, said Harry breathlessly. Let's find an empty room. You wait till you hear this. He made sure Peeves wasn't inside before shutting the door behind him, and then he told them what he'd seen and heard. So we were right. It is the Sorcerer's Stone, and Snape's trying to force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy. He said something about Quirrell's hocus pocus. I reckon there are a lot of other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Loads of enchantments, probably, and Quirrell would have done some anti-dark art spell that Snape needs to break through. So you mean that stone's only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape? Said Hermione in alarm. It'll be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. All right. The final chapter for today. Wow, we're really buzzing through this book. Chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback. Quirrell, however, must have been braver than they'd thought. In the weeks that followed, he did seem to be getting paler and thinner, but it didn't look as though he'd cracked yet. Every time they passed the third floor corridor, Harry, Ron, and Hermione would press their ears to the door to check that Fluffy were still growling inside. Snape was sweeping about in his usual bad temper, which surely meant the stone was still safe. Whenever Harry passed Quirrell these days, he gave him an encouraging sort of smile, and Ron had started telling people off for laughing at Quirrell's stutter. Quirrell had more on her mind than the Sorcerer's Stone. She had started drawing up study schedules and color-coding all her notes. Harry and Ron wouldn't have minded, but she kept nagging to do the same. Hermione, the exams are ages away. Ten weeks, Hermione snapped. That's not ages. That's like a second to Nicholas Flamel. But we're not 600 years old, Ron reminded her. Anyway, what are you studying for? You already know it all. What am I studying for? Are you crazy? You realize we need to pass these exams to get into the second year. They're very important. I should have started studying a month ago. I don't know what's come into me. Unfortunately, the teachers seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Hermione. They piled so much homework on them that the Easter holidays weren't nearly as much fun as the Christmas ones. It was hard to relax when Hermi with Hermione next to you reciting the 12 uses of dragon blood or practicing wand movements. Moaning and yawning, Harry and Ron spent most of their free time in the library with her trying to get through all their extra work. 
I'll never remember this, Ron burst out one afternoon, throwing down his quill and looking longingly out of the library window. It was really the first fine day they'd had in months. The sky forget-me-not blue and there was a feeling in the air of summer coming. Harry, who was looking up Dittany in 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, didn't look up until he heard Ron say, Hagrid, what are you doing in the library? Harry shuffled into view, hiding something behind his back. He looked very out of place in his moleskin overcoat. Just looking, he said in a shifty voice that got their interest at once. And what are you lot up to? He looked suddenly suspicious. You're not still looking for Nicholas Flamel, are you? Oh, we found out who he is ages ago, said Ron impressively, and we know what that dog is guarding. It's a sorcerer's... St Shh! Hagrid looked around quickly to see if anyone was listening. Don't go shouting about it. What's the matter with you? There are a few things we wanted to ask you as a matter of fact, said Harry, about what's guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Shh! Hagrid again. Listen, come and see me later. I'm not promising I'll tell you anything, mind, but don't go rabbiting about in here. Students aren't supposed to know. They'll think I've told you. See you later then, said Hag Harry. Hagrid shuffled off. What was he hiding behind his back, said Hermione thoughtfully. Do you think it had anything to do with the stone? I'm going to see what section he was in, said Ron, who had enough of working. He came back a minute later with a pile of books in his arms and slammed them down on the table. Dragons, he whispered. Hagrid was looking up stuff. Look at these, dragon species of Great Britain and Ireland from Egg to Inferno, a dragon keeper's guide. Hagrid's always wanted a dragon. He told me so the first time I ever met him, said Harry. But it's against our laws, said Ron. Dragon breeding was outlawed by the Warlock's Convention of 1709. Everyone knows that. It's hard to stop muggles from noticing us if we're keeping dragons in the back garden. Anyway, you can't tame dragons. It's dangerous. You should see the burns Charlie's got off wild ones in Romania. But there aren't wild dragons in Britain, said Harry. Of course there are, said Ron. Common Welsh green and Hebridean blacks. The Ministry of Magic had a job of hushing them up, I can tell you. Our kind have to keep putting spells on muggles who've spotted them to make them forget. So what on earth's Hagrid up to, said Hermione. When they knocked on the door of the gamekeeper's hut an hour later, they were surprised to see that all the curtains were closed. Hagrid called, who is it, before letting them in, and then shut the door quickly behind them. It was stifling hot inside. Even though it was such a warm day, there was a blazing fire in the grate. Hagrid made them tea and offered them stoat sandwiches, which they refused. So you wanted to ask me something? Yes, said Harry. There was no point in beating around the bush. We were wondering if you could tell us what's guarding the Sorcerer's Stone apart from Fluffy. Hagrid frowned at him. Of course I can't, he said. Number one, I don't know meself. Number two, you know too much already, so I wouldn't tell you if I could. That stone's here for a good reason. It was almost stolen out of Gringotts. I suppose you've worked that out and all. Beats me how to do, how you even know about fluff. Come on, Hagrid, you might not want to, but you do know. You know everything that goes on around here, said Hermione in a warm, flattering voice. Hagrid's beard twitched and tell he was smiling. We only wondered who had done the guarding, really, Hermione went on. We wondered who Dumbledore had trusted enough to help him, apart from you. Hagrid's chest swelled at these last words. Harry and Ron beamed at Hermione. Well, I don't suppose it could hurt to tell you that. He borrowed Fluffy from me. Then some of the teachers did enchantments. Professor Sprout, Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall. He ticked them off on his fingers. Professor Quirrell and Dumbledore himself did something, of course. Hang on, I've forgotten someone. Oh yeah, Professor Snape. Snape? Yeah, you're not still on about that, are you? Look, Snape helped protect the stone. He's not about to steal it. Harry knew Ron and Hermione were the same as he was. If Snape had been in on protecting the stone, it must have been easy to find out how the other teachers had guarded it. He probably knew ever how to get past it, aren't you, Hagrid? said Harry anxiously. And you wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Not even one of the teachers? Not a soul knows except me and Dumbledore, said Hagrid. Well, that's something, Harry muttered to the others. Hagrid, can we have a window open? I'm boiling. Can't, Harry, sorry, said Hagrid. Harry noticed him glance at the fire. Harry looked Hagrid, what's that? But he already knew what it was. In the very heart of the fire, underneath the kettle was a huge black egg. Ah, said Hagrid, fiddling nervously with his beard. That's, er... Where did you get it, Hagrid, said Ron, crouching over the fire to get a closer look at the egg. It must have cost you a fortune. Won it, said Hagrid. Last night, I was down in the village having a few drinks and got a game of cards with a stranger. I think he was quite, quite glad, to be honest. But what are you going to do with it when it's hatched, said Hermione. Well, I've been doing some reading, said Hagrid, pulling a large book from under his pillow. Got this out of the library. Dragon breeding for, breedin for pleasure and profit. It's a bit out of date, of course, but it's all in gear. Kept the egg in the, keep the egg in the fire, because their mothers breathe on them, see? And when it hatches, feed it on a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken blood every half hour. 
here how to recognize different eggs. What I got there is a Norwegian Ridgeback. They're rare, them. He looked very pleased with himself, but Hermione didn't. Hagrid, you live in a wooden house, she said, but Hagrid wasn't listening. He was humming merrily as he stoked the fire. So now they had something else to worry about. What might happen to Hagrid if anyone found out he was hiding an illegal dragon in his hut? Wonder what it's like to have a peaceful life, Ron sighed, as evening after evening they struggled through all the extra homework they were getting. Hermione had now started making study schedules for Harry and Ron, too. It was driving them nuts. Then, at breakfast time, Hedwig brought Harry another note from Hagrid. He had written only two words, it's hatching. Ron wanted to skip Herbology and go straight down to the hut. Hermione wouldn't hear of it. Hermione, how many times in our lives are we going to see a dragon hatching? We've got lessons. We'll get into trouble and that's not to, to what Hagrid's going to be in when someone finds out what he's doing. Shut up, Harry whispered. Malfoy was only a few feet away and he had stopped dead to listen. How much had he heard? Harry didn't like the look on Malfoy's face at all. Ron and Hermione argued all the way to Herbology and in the end, Hermione agreed to run down to Hagrid's with the other two when the bell sounded from the castle at the end of their lesson, the three of them dropped their trowels at once and hurried through the grounds to the edge of the forest. Hagrid greeted them, looking flushed and excited. It's nearly out, he ushered them inside. The egg was lying on the table. There were deep cracks in it. Something was moving inside. A funny clicking noise was coming from it. They all drew their chairs up to the table and watched with bated breath. All at once, there was a scraping noise and the egg split open. The baby dragon flopped onto the table. It wasn't pretty. Harry thought it looked like a crumpled umbrella. Its spiny wings were huge compared to the skinny jet black body. It had a long snout with wide nostrils, the stubs of horns, and eyes. It sneezed. A couple of sparks fell out of its snout. Isn't he beautiful? Hagrid murmured. He reached out a hand to stroke the dragon's head. It snapped at his fingers, showing pointed fangs. Bless him. Look, he knows his mummy, said Hagrid. Hagrid, said Hermione, how fast do Norwegian Ridgebacks grow exactly? Hagrid was about to answer when the color suddenly drained from his face. He leapt to his feet and ran to the window. What's the matter? Someone was looking through the gap in the curtains. It's a kid. He's running back up to school. Harry bolted to the door and looked out. Even at a distance, there was no mistaking him. Malfoy had seen the dragon. Something about the smile lurking on Malfoy's face during the next week made Harry, Ron, and Hermione very nervous. They spent most of their free time in Hagrid's darkened hut trying to reason with him. Just let it go, Harry urged. Set him free. I can't, said Hagrid. He's too little. He'd die. They looked at the dragon. It had grown three times in the week. Smoke kept furling out of its nostrils. Hagrid hadn't been doing his gamekeeping duties because the dragon was keeping him so busy. There were empty brandy bottles and chicken feathers all over the floor. I've decided to call him Norbert, said Hagrid, looking at the dragon with misty eyes. He really knows me now. Watch. Norbert, Norbert, where's mommy? He's lost his marbles, Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, give it two weeks and Norbert's going to be as long as your house. Malfoy could go to Dumbledore at any moment. Hagrid bit his lip. I know, I, I know I can't keep him forever, but I just can't just dump him. I can't. Harry suddenly turned to Ron. Charlie, he said. You're losing it too, said Ron. I'm Ron, remember? No, Charlie, your brother. Charlie in Romania studying dragons. We could send Norbert to him. Charlie can take care of him and then put him back in the wild. Brilliant, said Ron. How about it, Hagrid? And in the end, Hagrid agreed that they could send an owl to Charlie to ask him. The following week dragged by. Wednesday night found Hermione and Harry in the common room, long after everyone else had gone to bed. The clock on the wall had just chimed to midnight when the portrait hole burst open. Ron appeared out of nowhere and as he pulled off Harry's invisibility cloak. He had been down at Hagrid's hut, helping him feed Norbert, who is now eating dead rats by the crate. It bit me, he said, showing them his hand, which was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief. I'm not going to be able to hold a quill for a week. I tell you that dragon's the most horrible animal I've ever met. But the way Hagrid goes on about it, you'd think it was a fluffy little bunny rabbit. When it bit me, he told me frightening it. And when I left, he was singing it a lullaby. There was a tap on the dark window. It's Hedwig, said Harry, hurrying to let her in. She'll have Charlie's answer. The three of them put their heads together to read the note. Dear Ron, how are you? Thank you for the letter. I'd be glad to take the Norwegian Ridge back, but it won't be easy getting him here. I think the best thing will be to send him over, this, over with some friends of mine who are coming to visit me next week. Trouble is, they mustn't be seen carrying an illegal dragon. Could you get the Ridge back up at the tallest tower at midnight on Saturday? They can meet you there and take him away while it's still dark. Send me an answer as soon as possible. Love, Charlie. They looked at one another. 
We've got the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It shouldn't be too difficult. I think the cloak's big enough to cover two of us and Norbert. It was a mark of how bad the last week had been that the other two agreed with him. Anything to get rid of Norbert and Malfoy. There was a hitch. By the next morning, Ron's bitten hand had swollen to twice its usual size. He didn't know whether it was safe to go to would she recognize a dragon bite? By the afternoon, though, he had no choice. The cut had turned a nasty shade of green. It looked as if Norbert's fangs were poisonous. Harry and Hermione rushed up to the hospital wing at the end of the day to find Ron in a terrible state in bed. It's not just my hand, he whispered, although that feels like it's about to fall off. Malfoy told Madame Pomfrey he wanted to borrow so he could come and have a good laugh at me. He kept threatening to tell her what really bit me. I told her it was a dog, but I don't think she believes me. I shouldn't have hit him with that, at that Quidditch match. That's why he's doing this. Harry and Hermione tried to calm Ron down. It'll all be over at midnight on Saturday, said Hermione, but this didn't soothe Ron at all. On the contrary, he sat bolt upright and broke into a sweat. Midnight on Saturday, he said in a hoarse voice. Oh no, oh no, I've just remembered. Charlie's letter was in that book Malfoy took. He's going to know that we're getting rid of Norbert. Harry and Hermione didn't have a chance to answer. Madame Pomfrey came over at that moment and made them leave, saying Ron needed sleep. It's too late to change the plan now, Harry told Hermione. We haven't got time to send Charlie another owl, and this could be our only chance to get rid of Norbert. We'll have to risk it, and we have to get that in we have got that invisibility cloak. Malfoy doesn't know about that. They found Fang, the boarhound, sitting outside with a bandaged tail when they went to tell Hagrid, who opened a window to talk to them. I won't let you in, he puffed. Norbert's had a tricky stage. Nothing I can't handle. When they told him about Charlie's letter, his eyes filled with tears, although that might be because Norbert had bitten him on the leg. Oh, it's all right. He's only got my boot. Just play in. He's only a baby after all. The baby banged its tail on the wall, making the windows rattle. Harry and Hermione walked back to the castle, feeling Saturday couldn't come quickly enough. For Hagrid when the time came for him to say goodbye to Norbert if they hadn't been so worried about what they had to do. It was a very dark, cloudy night, and they were a bit late arriving at Hagrid's hut because they'd had to wait for Peeves to get out of their entrance hall, where he'd been playing tennis against the wall. Hagrid had Norbert packed and ready in a large crate. He's got a lot of rats and some brandy for the journey, said Hagrid in a muffled voice, and I've packed his teddy bear in case he gets lonely. From inside the crate came ripping noises that sounded scary as though the teddy was having its head torn off. Bye-bye, Norbert, Her Hagrid sobbed as Harry and Hermione covered the crate with the invisibility cloak and stepped underneath it themselves. Mummy will never forget you. How they managed to get the crate back up to the castle, they never knew. Nearer, as they heaved Norbert up the marble staircase in the entrance hall and along the dark corridors. Up another staircase, then another, even one of Harry's shortcuts didn't make the work much easier. Nearly there, Harry panted as they reached corridor beneath the tallest tower. Then a sudden movement ahead of them made them almost drop the crate. Forgetting that they were already invisible, they shrank into the shadows, staring at the dark outlines of two people grappling with each other ten feet away. A lamp flared. Professor McGonagall, in a tartan bathrobe and a hairnet, had Malfoy by the ear. Detention, she shouted, and twenty points from Slytherin, walking around in the middle of the night. How dare you? You don't understand, Professor. Harry Potter's coming. He's got a dragon. What utter rubbish! How dare you tell such lies! Come on, I shall see Professor Snape about you, Malfoy. The steep spiral staircase up, the, up to the top of the tower seemed the easiest thing in the world after that. Not until they'd stepped out into the cold night air did they throw off the cloak, glad to be able to breathe properly again. Hermione did a sort of jig. Malfoy's got detention! I could sing! Don't, Harry advised her. Chuckling about Malfoy, they waited, Norbert thrashing about in his crate. About ten minutes later, four broomsticks came sweeping down out of the darkness. Charlie's friends were a cheery lot. They showed Harry and Hermione the harness they'd rigged up so they could suspend Norbert between them. They all helped buckle Norbert safely into it, and then Harry and Hermione shook hands with the others and thanked them very much. At last, Norbert was going on. They slipped back down the spiral staircase, their hearts as light as their hands, now that Norbert was off them. No more dragon, Malfoy in detention, what could spoil their happiness? The answer to that was waiting at the foot of the stairs. As they stepped into the corridor, his face loomed suddenly out of the darkness. Well, 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 he whispered, we are in trouble. They left the invisibility cloak on top of the tower. Okay, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, tomorrow is going to be the end of our themed Harry Potter week, and we'll finish up the book. Um, all right, cool. Have a good rest of your day.